Welcome everyone. My name is Corinne and I will be your moderator this evening. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Anthony Manito as our speaker as he will be sharing real world case reviews covering the areas of implant planning, TMD, and airway assessment. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled have a question on your console, and we will answer them live at the end. This webinar is sponsored by Plan Mecca, and Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Manito, welcome, and thank you for being with us tonight. I will pass on over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Tony Manito. I'm a general dentist in Charleston, South Carolina, and an adjunct faculty member at the Medical University of South Carolina College of Dental Medicine. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about cone beam CT technology, uh, and specifically my experience with Plan Mecca's cone beams uh, over the last few years. So I'd like to share a little bit of my history with you. Recently, I've uh, transitioned from academics. I was at MUSC for the past 12 years uh, into a private practice and was lucky enough to join the private practice uh, of a dentist named Dr. Amanda C. You may have heard of her. She's uh, incredibly talented, uh, very well educated, uh, and very kind person. Uh, so I've had the, the privilege of working with her for the last um, three years. Uh, and when we were looking to outfit a new office and looking at the technology that was available at the time, she tasked me uh, at coming up with, uh, you know, what CBCT we wanted to buy. And so after doing some some digging uh, and some research, uh, we decided that uh, the Plan Mecca uh, Pro Max Mid, which is what we have pictured here, uh, we were going to get in our new office that we were renovating and it was such a hit in that office that she decided to buy another one for her existing office so we currently have uh, two pro max mids uh, which we are absolutely loving use them every single day uh, and are able to diagnose far more than we ever could using just 2d radiology so what a, one of the things i want to talk about and i will talk about extensively are uh, some of the differences between 2D and 3D and what a big step forward is it is in regards to your ability to diagnose and treat uh, what ails the patient. I mean, how many times has a patient come in and you took a 2D radiograph of some sort on them and you just don't see anything that stands out to you that would, would cause you to, to initiate treatment? It uh, happened all the time uh, in my time in private practice. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about that, but first I want to start with a little bit of the basics of cone beam CT and specifically kind of how it works because uh, it's always good to start at the beginning, right? So how does a CT work? Well, basically it begins very similar to how you um, begin with a Panorex. Uh, it has an x-ray tube. Uh, you have the patient that is positioned between the x-ray tube and then a, a detector, basically. Um, and the x-ray tube rotates, uh, as does the detector, and you get your image as it rotates. So one of the things that, that was a driving force behind our decision to buy the Plan Mecca system was the robotics of it. And, and having talked to a lot of people within the company and within the uh, kind of the tech sector in dentistry, uh, it was apparent that uh, Plan Mecca's uh, robotics stood out. And what I mean by that is um, they have something they call SCARA, and I won't bore you with, the, with the, what, what those letters mean, but basically what it is is uh, the arm that maneuvers uh, the, the CBCT uh, basically um, is got multiple joints, almost like a, a human arm, where we have a wrist joint, we have an elbow joint, we have a shoulder joint. And because it's not just a linear movement, uh, it's able to, um, to do many actually unique um, rotations around the patient to give you all sorts of different options as far as um, diagnostic images that you can take. And what sounded even better for me is this uh, basically uh, SCARA technology allows your unit to be upgraded over time. So we all have this fear when we buy technology that it's going to become obsolete in a few years. Well, Plan Mecca has a 20-year uh, history 
of having uh, technology that's actually able to be upgraded. So you can keep the same piece of technology um, and as the abilities of the technology uh, increase and as the software gets better, uh, your machine can be upgraded along with it uh, to make sure that it continues to be relevant. So you don't have to scrap the whole thing and, and buy a brand new machine every few years. So that was a, a really important deciding factor for us. Um, but once you've acquired the image, um, basically you have all these raw data and think of, of a CBCT as um, basically capturing a lot of single images, all right, 2D images that are then stitched together uh, to create a 3D uh, rendered uh, object, all right? Um, and that all happens within the software that's included within the CBCT. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Calm software because Calm is an algorithm. It's, a, it's a, something within the software that is able to take um, any patient movement that happens uh, during the image acquisition. So it could be something as simple as the tube head bumps a patient in the shoulder and they kind of move a little bit to allow the tube head to complete its rotation. That little bit of movement can oftentimes, and in many other systems, cause that image to be not non-diagnostic. Okay, what does that mean? If something's non-diagnostic, it means you have to take the image over. Okay, so it's costing you more time and it's uh, costing the patient basically additional uh, dosage, right? They're getting, uh, they're having the stand in the CBCT, they're getting more radiation dosage, uh, basically double what they would have had you captured that image in the first uh, go round. So Calm is a huge, huge asset uh, for Plan Mecca's system. Like I said, it's just part of the software and it, and it also has the ability to be upgraded and improved over time. And it's my understanding that they're working very hard to improve that Calm algorithm as well. And it's already really, really good. Um, so another, another image uh, uh, reconstruction tool uh, that works really well and was a one of the deciding factors for once again, why we purchased this technology. And then finally, once that image uh, is reconstructed, you have the ability to visualize uh, all you, uh, your image. Basically what it gives you is it gives you an image that kind of looks like this. And this is my head can view these CT images from either the coronal plane, the axial or transverse plane, or the sagittal plane. And then in that lower right, you have a rendering of the skull, which I love to show patients. I, they think it's super cool um, and it can really, really be a dramatic uh, way for, for you to show uh, patients what's going on uh, in their mouth. So. This is basically uh, how you would view the CBCT. You can go uh, slice by slice through each of these um, three orientations to view your CBCT and read it. And, you know, when Playmeco was talks about their CBC technology, they use uh, the ABCDs of CBCT. And, and these are some of the kind of the the things that you don't necessarily think about when you're buying a cone beam. Um, the first one is A for autofocus. And autofocus uh, is when you are taking a CBCT, you can actually uh, extrapolate a panoramic image from that cone beam. Uh, and what allows you to do that in part, uh, at least um, to do it in a way where you have consistency in the quality of that panoramic image is the autofocus uh, in the software. And what the autofocus does is it allows you to select the panoramic curve uh, of the image, and then the autofocus lo locates the apices of the maxillary anterior teeth, and based off those position will autofocus uh, to create a really nice panoramic image for you. So this is something that we have found to be very helpful as, you know, old habits die hard. So sometimes in, in our uh, EagleSoft software, it's nice just to have a panoramic image in there. And since we're mostly taking CBCT nowadays, uh, to have those, uh, C, those panoramic images extrapolated and placed in the chart uh, is something that is just, uh, you know, it's comfortable for a lot of us as dentists who have used 2D technology our entire life. It's nice to see the big picture of a, of a panoramic image sometimes. 
Uh, B is for bite wings. And you don't think about extra oral bite wings or the need for extra oral bite wings very often. But the reality is we all have patients who are not at all comfortable taking intraoral uh, bite wings, or they have a lot, large tori, or they have a sensitive gag reflex and could really, really benefit from an extra oral uh, methodology of taking those bite wings. And so Pan, uh, uh, Plan Mecca has a really great um, bite wing and using that robotic technology that I talked about earlier, they're able to really get nice images um, and at a lower radiation dose oftentimes than what you would even get for 2D uh, images. So, and, and an added benefit of uh, extra oral bite wings is that you capture all the apices. And this has always been something that I've had a little bit of an issue with is we take 2D bite wings and we have for, for decades uh, on patients routinely, but how often do we take anything that shows us the apice? Well, this uh, extra oral bite wing does show us those apices every single time. And so it's nice to have, and especially for, like I said, patients who don't tolerate uh, intraoral bite wings, this is a, a huge feature and something that uh, we've had a lot of great feedback on the, the ability to take extra oral bite wings. C is for calm. I've talked a little bit about this algorithm. Uh, when you have any patient movement at all during the, the image, uh, this is able to basically... Um, reposition those scans as they overlay them into uh, a three-dimensional image and basically negates uh, a lot of that movement. Uh, and so when you have an image that would otherwise have been uh, non-diagnostic because of patient movement, Calm is able to save that scan for you um, and keep you from having to retake that image once again, which saves time uh, and saves the patient uh, dosage. So and then, and the last thing is dosage, which this, uh, if I'm honest, this is the number one reason why we purchase Plan Mecca CBCTs. They have uh, what is called ultra low dose um, uh, settings within uh, the CBCT. And I take absolutely every image on ultra low dose because uh, there really is no reason why you wouldn't. There is a significant decrease in uh, patient dosage using the ultra low dose settings uh, and the images are uh, every bit as diagnostic as they would be if we use the normal settings so you can see you get an effective patient dose and this is going to vary basically but you can take a full cbct image uh, on ultra low dose uh, and have the patient exposure of about 14.7 micro sieverts to put that into perspective, a full mouth series is about 40 microsieverts and a panoramic image is anywhere between 15 to 30. So we're getting so much more information than we would have uh, otherwise in uh, a 2D image, but really not uh, radiating the patient uh, anymore. And in some cases, even less than, than what we would have for two dimensional images. So ultra low dose for me, is a is a huge huge benefit. Uh, I'll talk about some studies uh, here in a moment um, that show how well this works. And John Ludlow, who is basically the first name in uh, CBCT imaging, if you look through the literature on cone beam, uh, he is all over the literature and is a uh, tremendous asset to offering a lot of information on all things cone beam. Uh, but he did a study um, along with the University of Helsinki to look at specifically Plan Mecca's uh, imaging and specifically low dose and how low dose compared to the normal imaging array and if you really like you know how low low dose is is fine you know and dandy but if you get can't get an image out of it that is diagnostic what's the point right so you have to have low dose but you have to have really good images as well that allow you to to diagnose whatever your patient needs and so uh, this is a, a study that, that looked at that, and basically what they found is that using ultra-low dose on Plan Mecca's CBCT, you actually had a 77% reduction in dose um, with no statistical reduction in image quality. So you got uh, an image that was uh, as diagnostic 
as you would have with a normal CBCT, with, but with a 77% reduction. And that right there is why I take everything in ultra low dose. It just makes sense to me. And it's a huge benefit for our patients. Um, the other thing that they note is that if you have a CBCT and you're, you're looking for pretty pictures, right? You want something that is um, super crisp and super sharp, right? Um, just to have a pretty picture, then um, you're doing the patient a disservice because you're in order to get those really sharp images, you have to use higher levels of radiation. Um, and so it's our responsibility as pra practitioners to make sure that we're, we're shooting for the amount of radiation that gets us an image that is diagnostic. All right. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to, you know, blow, you don't have to blow it up and put it on your wall in your waiting room. Uh, to show how pretty your CBCT works. That's that's not the point. The point is that you get something that is diagnostic. Um, and so ultra low dose for us has been a real, real key to getting um, extremely diagnostic um, images. And I'm going to show you uh, a, quite a few examples of these images, along with some examples uh, from some of my friends who have been using these machines for a few years as well. So I really wanted to give you kind of the gamut of examples of what you can accomplish with a cone beam versus using 2D uh, radiology. And I always like to show this slide. Um, people kind of, he, he, they kind of giggle at it when, when they see it, when I'm doing live lectures. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I stole this from, from Zach Evans, who was a good friend of mine. But, uh, you know, here it looks like, um, I don't know, I forget which royal this is, but, but Prince uh, Harry maybe. Uh, is giving somebody the bird, but when you look at it from a different angle, you can see that, in fact, he's he's telling the press that he now has three children. And so I feel like this is such a, a great uh, metaphor for uh, CBCT in that the fact that if you only see uh, a tooth, for instance, from one point of view, from one image and a 2D x-ray, you're probably missing a lot of the information. Uh, that you should be getting. So with CBCT, we're able to just see so much in those three dimensions, uh, and it really, really allows you to definitively diagnose issues that your patients are having instead of saying, well, we'll kind of watch this and, you know, let me know if the symptoms get worse, and then we'll, we'll figure out what to do with it. Uh, and this is a really good example of uh, a patient who came into our office, this was kind of at the beginning of our CBCT journey. And she came in, she was having some pain in the lower left, kind of 1920 area. And we took a 2D image uh, and you can see not a perfect image, but you could see uh, well enough that, uh, you know, you don't really see anything um, that's going on too much in that image. Maybe you see a little, a little fuzziness, uh, a little, uh, diffuse uh, radiolucency between uh, the implant at 19 and um, the molar at uh, number, or the implant at 20 and the and the molar at number 19. Uh, but once you take a CBCT, then there is absolutely no doubt that there is something going on there. And what we had was significant bone loss uh, between that implant and the molar. And now we know exactly what we have to do. It's not a watch. It's not, hey, let's Let's keep an eye on this. Let me know if, if the symptoms get worse. Uh, this along with some probing. And of course we knew there was an issue because um, you know, we had probed the patient and found a significant probing depth, but nothing was showing up on the, on the 2D uh, X-ray. So once we captured our CBCT, we knew that it was time to refer this patient to uh, periodontist for some implant maintenance uh, to try to save that situation and obviously try to try to salvage that molar as well. Uh, we we wouldn't have, I don't know that I would have necessarily come to that same conclusion. I hope I would have based off the 2D x-ray, uh, but with the 3D, it was a slam dunk. And uh, thank, thankful uh, for Dr. Mike Young for sharing some of his experience with me. He's been doing CBCT with Plan Mecca for a long time as well. And this was one of his cases that came in with uh, Pain, uh, patient had pain in the upper right quad, upper right quadrant when eating, um, and once again, take a two D bite wing, especially in the maxillary molar area and premolar area with that sinus superimposition. It's very very difficult to to diagnose anything definitively. So the two D uh, radiograph didn't reveal anything, uh, 
Uh, but when you take a CBCT, now you see, uh, especially in the sagittal view, um, slam dunk, there is absolutely a uh, periapical radiolucency uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and it's very specific. You know, anybody who's going to do a root canal these days, at least I would hope, uh, would have CBCT imaging as well, because you're able to pinpoint the location of the canals. You're able to see, you know, if there are accessory canals and things like that. So it really helps uh, you to not only diagnose, but treat these cases um, to make sure that we're doing excellent dentistry, excellent dentistry for our patients. Uh, there was a study done uh, a few years ago, uh, actually 2009. So this has uh, been a while ago, even that that looked at us um, basically comparing an intraoral PA uh, to figure out how, what percentage of the time a clear lesion could be diagnosed uh, compared to a cone beam CT. And what they found is that uh, you can get about 25% success rate of diagnosis with a 2D PA, whereas you get 100% uh, diagnosis with a 3D CBCT image. So, um, you know, there's so much data out there like this that just shows um, the, the clear, um, yeah, the clear benefit of 3D over 2D. Uh, this is another patient of mine who came in, and this is you know, we all have probably have patients who've come in who have done, um, you know, small, small correct, um, basically um, do it yourself ortho, right? Um, and so um, this patient came in and was having a little bit of mobility in her mandibular anteriors. And as soon as she told me uh, that she had done um, do it yourself ortho, I kind of had an idea what I was going to find. But sh uh, sure enough, we took a CBCT and you're able to see that. Uh, some of those incisors have been pushed straight through uh, the bone. So now, I mean, we're talking about a, a patient in their 20s uh, who now we're going to have to come up with uh, with a plan for ma maintaining these teeth for the rest of her life. Um, and so, you know, I don't know how, how to necessarily deal with this in my practice, but uh, we, we're able to refer them to perio. And once again, looking at a few of the different views, you're able to see that those those teeth have, have been pushed straight through the cortical plate. So very unfortunate situation. Um, but with 2D imaging, I mean, even the patient understands what's going on here. So uh, it's a good good teaching tool as well. Uh, and I go through, when I go through uh, CBCT, uh, the patient is right there uh, a vast majority of the time. So we're going through it together and we're talking about what I'm seeing. I'm asking them questions based off what I'm finding on the cone beam. Uh, things like, do you have any uh, TMD issues? You know, are, are you able to breathe through your nose? Uh, do you have any sinus uh, troubles? Things like that, because we can see all sorts of things on the cone beam that we, we have never really been able to see before. So that's uh, very, very helpful for us. Uh, this is another patient who came in who basically had no issues. This was a CBCT that we took on an, as a routine part of our new patient exam. Uh, and as we look at these images, we can see that there is some s significant asymmetry here, uh, particularly in that upper left uh, picture. If we look at this in the coronal plane, you can see that the left side sinus is completely occluded. And in fact, a lot of those ethmoids are as well. Um, so this is pretty significant in that even if this was the very first CBCT you'd ever read, you would definitely pick up on that. And as we go around, kind of go around the horn, we can see that uh, now we have a, a distinct periapical radiolucency associated with number 14. And in fact, when, even when we look at the skull image, we can see that that periapical radiolucency has cause a fenestration in uh, the cortical plate on the buckle. And, you know, we've got some serious infection going on. So this was an eye-opening experience for me. Uh, patient, we got the patient on antibiotics immediately. We got that tooth treated with a root canal. Um, and we took another CBCT a couple months later once the treatment was done. And a lot of that infection and that cloudiness that you see in the maxillary sinus had resolved. So um, man, uh, you know, we probably would have seen with a, a full mouth series with a 2D, uh, maybe, but who knows with that sinus up there in that area, sometimes you get that superimposition and it's a hard, 
hard thing to diagnose. Um, so very happy that we found this with our uh, CBCT imaging. Here's another example from Dr. Young. Um, he took a CBCT image of a patient uh, who had had a root canal on a tooth, but um, did not, was still having some, some symptoms and was still having some issues. So, and, and had a, a periapical radiolucency that was not healing. So looking at a CBCT, uh, they were able to see basically that during root canal treatment, um, they had missed a canal. And this had been done previously. Um, and you can see uh, on this premolar that there is a wide open canal there. And it's clear as day on a CBCT, but that's not something you would ever have seen necessarily on a 2D x-ray. So once again, for endo, it's a no-brainer. If you're doing endo in your office, you really need a CBCT, uh, in my opinion. And this is one from uh, my good buddy, buddy Darren Clark in Nashville. Uh, this is, uh, he does a lot of sleep apnea uh, treatments uh, and TMD treatments as well. Uh, he's just a really, really interesting guy. Great to sit down and have a beer with if you ever have an opportunity. Um, but this patient was referred by a sleep physician because they were having signs of sleep apnea, not, you know, not able to, to really uh, sleep soundly throughout the night. Uh, and having some trouble with their uh, breathing and things like that. And so um, what, they, what they found as part of their new patient intake, when they, they take a CBCT as well, um, to understand the disposition of the sinuses, the airway, and the TMD. Uh, and what they found is this patient had a chronic sinus infection. Uh, and so this is something that had been going on for years and years and was definitely affecting the patient's ability to breathe. So basically what it comes down to is this patient did not have obstructive sleep apnea. They had this long-standing chronic sinusitis. And so what they were able to do was they referred for, to an ENT for management of the infection, and they were able to follow up once that infection was resolved and found that no uh, obstructive sleep apnea actually existed. Um, and once they um, were able to clear up that infection, basically uh, the patient was much better and was able to get a good night's sleep. So what they were able to do just by taking a CBCT is they were able to save the patient a lot of time, money, uh, save the practice a lot of uh, kind of grief because we all know that when you're treating a patient, it's not going well. It's it's not a not a great situation for us as dentists. Uh, and any attempt to resolve the you know the perceived obstructive sleep apnea with an oral appliance therapy would have been expensive, time consuming, and in the end unsuccessful. So, um, really interesting case of what you can find with a CBCT that you probably would have missed with 2D radiology. Thing to figure out why things aren't recording at this juncture and maybe figure out how to best move forward with this. I was very lucky during my time at the university to work with a great group of tech loving guys. And this is Wally Renee, uh, Mark Ludlow and Zach Evans. And these fellows taught me a lot about uh, digital dentistry in general, but uh, a lot about implant placement. Uh, and was able to really introduce me to some of the principles that are important to use during placement of implants. Um, and the whole idea behind uh, guided surgery is to make sure that you don't have situations like this where the implant placement is not ideal for restoring that implant, right? I mean, the whole idea is not just to put the implant in bone somewhere, but to put it in an ideal location that will allow for uh, an aesthetic and functional restoration. And so cases like this um, are difficult to deal with. They uh, often require the practitioner, the general dentist, or whoever's restoring this case to, to do things a little bit differently than they normally would. And sometimes it's necessary, but in this case, there was, there was plenty of bone. Um, we should have should have been able to do a screw retained restoration, but unfortunately we had to do cement retained uh, because of the implant placement. So this was the first time that I had used this specific uh, oral surgeon for a case, and this was the last time that I used him. So 
uh, one of the things that I want to talk about in relationship to the to the Cone Beam CT and what it what it will do for you is allow you to really do prosthetically driven implant planning, which is the ideal way I think to do implant uh, placement. So a cone beam is great because it shows you in three uh, dimensions where the bone is and where the vital structures are. Um, and it's really, really, I think the standard of care for implant placement. I can't imagine placing an implant off of a 2D X-ray nowadays. Um, and basically when it comes to doing um, implant placement, uh, the studies, and there are many of them, show that guided surgery is far more accurate than freehanding. Um, and that goes without saying, I mean, I think we can all understand that that would be the case. Uh, but the to the extent that it is more accurate is pretty alarming. I mean, uh, this one study showed that there is about an 88% error with uh, angulation and depth um, and things like that when it comes to free-handed surgery versus 6% error when it comes to guided surgery. So, you know, guided surgery is not foolproof by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, it is a very good methodology for getting an accurate placement. Uh, one that is, that is uh, in more cases, ideal for, uh, for fabrication of a final prosthesis. So um, one of the things, and I, I want to thank Zach Evans for, uh, for teaching me this all those years ago is, um, you know, you have the prosthetic design is the beginning of your planning process. So you're actually starting at the end. You're planning where that restoration is going to go. Ideally, you're planning the aesthetics, the occlusion, uh, where is the CEJ, where is the incisal or the occlusal edge. All that stuff is being hashed out in the very, very beginning. And then you're working backwards based off that restoration location. Uh, where is the best place to put the implant? Uh, where is the best place for soft tissue stability? Where is the best place for aesthetics? Where is the best place to put uh, the implant for a screw retained restoration? Uh, all these things uh, you're able to balance within the software uh, to get what would be an ideal implant placement uh, for any given procedure. And in the end, if you're not able to get an ideal implant placement, you know that going into it because you've done all the planning. And so you're much more prepared on the day of surgery. Um, and so you can get a, a, a basically a confirmation of the plan and a restorative prognosis to be able to tell the patient uh, yes, this might be a difficult procedure, you know, to move forward with to get a good result aesthetically. You can uh, basically um, keep the patient's expectations realistic, and uh, and allow them to, um, you know, to know exactly what to expect once the procedure is completed. So, you know, I love uh, virtual implant placement. Uh, the software within Romexis is extremely powerful, yet extremely easy to use. Uh, there's a bunch of courses for that um, given in several different locations. But um, once again, to be able to confirm the placement of the plan and then create that guide and then 3D print that guide for a, a matter of dollars uh, is extremely convenient. Uh, and, it, and it keeps all that control in the practitioner's hands. So we do this pretty routinely in our practice uh, where we're creating guides um, and these guides, if you, if you are to send out for them, can be relatively expensive. So to keep it in-house, you can save an awful lot of money because um, it costs basically a little bit of your time and just a few dollars, uh, maybe two or three dollars in resin for the 3D printer. And then whatever the cost of the sleeve is, usually about 20 bucks for that. And so when you have a case like this where we have a central incisor that is got a giant post in it uh, that has a vertical root fracture, uh, when that tooth is extracted, the implant uh, is planned, and in this case, this is one of Dr. Evans's cases, uh, the implant goes exactly where it was planned to go. So you're able to get a really, really nice result uh, in cases like this. And so I want to share one of the cases that I, I did with some of my colleagues at the university a few years ago. So this is an older case, um, but this is one that I, I kept all in-house. So all the lab work, all the 
the um, everything basically was done by myself, uh, except the, the surgical placement of the implant was done by one of my colleagues in the periodontal department. So this patient came to me just as you see with a, a vertical root fracture tooth that had to be extracted. Extraction was done some time ago and the patient was completely healed and now ready for an implant. So the first thing I did was to do an intraoral scan and to uh, basically wax up that site with a restoration. You can see this patient does not have an ideal smile contour. She's got very much a, that reverse smile line. And so part of what we talked about initially was planting the seed of, do we want to do a little bit more um, with this case rather than just making this a single implant and a restoration? And so I floated that idea out early on. The patient initially wasn't interested in it, but uh, later on she kind of came around and so based off of my wax up uh, was able to virtually place that implant in that space we 3d printed the surgical guide and one one of the things that's really cool about romexis is it allows you to export a lot of different information out of your surgical plan and one of those things are something called uh, tubes basically so you have a, an extension tube that you can export and based off of that extension tube, you can create a pre-surgical provisional. Now that is a tooth that in this case, I milled from my Plan Mill 30S uh, out of a resin material that I brought to the surgery uh, that was a, a prefabricated restoration. So the implant is not even in yet. We already have a, a, a temporary that's ready to go that's been customized for the patient based off of my surgical plan. So here we are with the guide in place. Uh, we are able to, once again, have that surgical placement of the implant. Very, very um, accurate based off of that plan. Here is the immediate uh, post-op of the implant in place. And then a little bit of um, characterization of the prefabricated provisional. And there that is, uh, thankfully, the implant torque. So we were able to utilize that. Uh, once again, at this appointment, reminded the patient, hey, we can, we can do just this tooth or we can, we can talk about doing maybe four teeth uh, to improve the aesthetics of your smile. Uh, as you see, tooth number seven is, is way off as far as the shade and eight and nine have really large composites on them uh, as well. So um, these teeth are not exactly in great shape to begin with. So there's a lot of potential here to, to help the patient smile. Um, and so, you know, gave the patient some time to heal. 12 weeks later, she came back and it turns out, yes, she is interested in doing those four units. So basically did another intraoral scan, uh, this time uh, for the intent of doing a wax up on that patient. Did the wax up, uh, patient loved it, uh, decided to move forward with the case, um, did all the, the design and things like that and was able to mill uh, those designs that we created once again within Romexis um, did a little staining and glazing this is kind of my thing I've been doing CAD CAM for about 10 years uh, love CAD, the CAD, uh, the Plan Mecca CAD CAM system as well this is another reason why we went with Plan Mecca system is because uh, I was familiar already with Romexis uh, and I had used we had at the university we had two Plan Mecca CBCTs as well that I had got, had a chance to use over the years and just talking with the people at the university, they had been very happy with the results they had gotten with those, with those products. So uh, back to the case, uh, did a little staining and glazing for these, and we ended up doing some uh, A1MT uh, Emax restorations, and were able to take her from from here to here. So you know, a really really interesting case where we can sh show off basically all the things that we're able to accomplish in Romexis. Uh, but the big thing is, you know, the CBCT allows us to plan that implant and to do it in such a way that we knew we'd be successful. And uh, with some with some bonuses of being able to export that plan in such a way that we're able to create some, you know, pre-surgical provisionals and things like that so that the patient can go home with a tooth. Um, and so we're, she was extremely happy with, with how this case turned out. Um, and... Uh, and yeah, and it was all thanks to the power of Romexis uh, and that CBCT. So, you know, why do you need a, a comb beam in your practice? Well, once again, if you're doing if you're doing root canals, if you're doing implant placement, I, I think it's a no-brainer. Personally, in my opinion, uh, you need to be 
those two procedures uh, to be predictable, uh, you really need 3D uh, imaging technology. Uh, but for most of us who are general dentists and may not do implants or uh, root canals in our practice, if you, if you see more, you're able to treat more. Uh, and that is uh, so beneficial, not only to our patients, right? Our patients come to us for our expertise, if we're able to diagnose, uh, we're able to solve their problems. They appreciate that. That's why they seek out our care. Uh, but the other thing is it's it's helpful to your bottom line. I mean, let's face it, we're, we're all in a business. Uh, and if you're treating more, you're producing more uh, and you're going to make more in the end. So, uh, you know, I ask a lot of really smart people this question all the time. If I meet somebody who is a digital guru, I ask them, what is the first piece of digital equipment that that you would say uh, a new dentist should buy? And I would say a vast majority of them, the answer is a cone beam CT. Uh, and once again, with Plameca, you get so many great features. Uh, the ultra low dose for me is, I think, the best feature. But the ability to be able to upgrade your machine over time is also hugely beneficial because we're all a little concerned about our technology becoming obsolete. Um, and so those two features along with things like Calm, which is uh, you know, able to, to kind of resuscitate uh, some of those scans that may not have worked out well because of patient movement uh, is a huge, huge thing as well. And then you know, don't sleep on uh, uh, something like extra oral bite wings, which is, you know, it's the kind of stuff that helps build uh, you know, your practice. Patients talk about positive experiences and i know for me personally i hate getting that i would much rather get an injection than get a bite wing taken on me for whatever reason that's the part of a dental appointment that i dislike the most and so for patients like me the the ability to take extra oral bite wings can be a huge uh, benefit and a practice builder as well so i appreciate your time i'll be happy to take some questions and once again i appreciate you joining me this evening Thank you so much, Dr. Manito. At this time, we are going to open up the Q&A session of the webinar. If you have a question, please type it in the have a question box on your console. Also, we did record tonight's webinar and we'll email the recording out sometime in the next week. All right, I'm going to pass it on over to you, Dr. Manito and Gary, who will be moderating the Q&A session. Thank you so much for joining our live Q&A session, Dr. Manito. We do have a few questions lined up for you already. Our first question is from Eric, who asks, I've heard numerous ways to charge a patient from billing it as a pano to an FMX or NPs. How do you guys charge it? That's a really good question. Um, and actually, I have heard those same conversations uh, several times. And uh, I will tell you how we do it. We, we, tend to, we tend to do things by the kind of by the letter of the law. And I think we had our, our office manager reached out and just found out what was acceptable from several insurance companies. And, and what they determined is that if you, for instance, extract a pan from a CBCT, you cannot code that as a PAN to the insurance company. So what we do is for our new patient services or the first time that a patient gets a CBCT, we just have actually a relatively low fee. I think it's somewhere around $75 that we charge the patient for that, for that cone beam. Um, and then if we are taking a cone beam as part of, say, an implant workup, uh, we, will, we will charge them a, a different fee for that uh, as part of the the implant fee. So um, we tried to make it as simple as possible for our new patients and not have this exorbitant charge because uh, we do routinely take CBCTs on new patients. However, um, you know, we want to, we want the patients to understand that this is a whole nother level of diagnostic ability and, uh, and, and, and to value that. So we, we will sit down and go over that CBCT together with the patient so that they understand uh, the value of it and what they are getting for their money. So the next time we need a, a cone beam for any reason, they understand that. So that's that's an excellent question. We tend to, to try to make it as as simple as possible and to and to kind of follow the letter of the law as far as far as insurance companies go. All right, thank you for that clarification. Our next question is from Ken, who asks: Are the CT bite wing X rays as diagnostic as? P-A-E-W-S, I think that's bite wing. 
Yeah, I mean, they they are a little bit different, um, to be honest, and it takes a little bit getting used to. Um, just like when I when I and I am old enough to to remember film bite wings, um, believe it or not, um, I had uh, film bite wings for my first probably almost ten years in practice, and um, you know, moving to to digital X rays was a bit of a transition, and I think. Uh, to be honest with you, when you when you switch to um, to extra oral bite wings, there is a bit of a transition there as well because you're seeing so much more uh, of the patient anatomy. And so, um, my understanding also is that you you um, when you have areas that are radiolucent, for instance, areas of, of potential decay, um, it's much easier to see those on extra oral bite wings. And um, and I have found that uh, to be the case. So even incipient lesions can show up. A little more clearly, but there's definitely a bit of an adjustment period that that at least I had when making that transition. Um, and so I would, you know, I would absolutely ask uh, if you have a rep who comes by your office or somebody from Climeco or even a different uh, uh, CDCT company, if you're thinking about going that direction, uh, make make sure you ask them to see some samples of those so you can get an idea of what what you'll be able to to accomplish your practice with those uh you know the proof is in the pudding and uh and you need to be able to to see things for yourself to, to know whether they're going to be uh you know you're able to, to diagnose off of those but i have had uh i've had pretty good success with those once i got over that initial kind of uh kind of learning curve with um with those all right our next question is from donald who asks which scan bodies do you recommend Oh, that's a um, that's a that's a great question. Um, and this is what I this is what I always tell people. So I I personally use uh, a laboratory for most of my implants called True Abutment, and they have their own scan bodies. Um, and and it, I think the easiest, simplest solution is if you have a laboratory or a set of laboratories that you work with often, just call them up, ask them what they use, what they prefer. Because um, one, they have to have the ability within their software to to turn that uh, scan body scan into something that their lab software can use. So they have to have the implant library, the scan body library in their software. And that's not usually too big a deal. Um, but the other thing is there are definitely some scan bodies that are much easier to scan than others. And I think those that are made of a material called PEAK uh, tend to scan very easily. Those that are made of metal, and there are only a few of those, tend to be very difficult uh, to scan. So um, I would first and foremost reach out to your laboratory, find out what they recommend, um, especially if you, know, if you use only one or maybe two laboratories for your implant cases. Um, they're going to be a great resource for you. And you know, I could tell you one thing, but if that's not you know, something that's in their implant library, then that's not really me helping you out. So uh, it's a simple phone call to your lab should uh, should find out what they recommend. And, and I would absolutely go with that. Great. Uh, our next question is from Quinn, who asks, does it take one pass or two passes to do a large 3D scan for airway or sleep ap apnea scan? So it depends. and. You know, um, I would say that for our PMD patients, we take the largest volume scan, and that is the only one on our CBCT that requires two passes. The rest of them, if you're if you're doing an airway scan, for instance, uh, you you can get away with a much smaller volume that can be accomplished in one pass. So. The only time that we will take that two pass um, um, scan is when we're trying to evaluate the uh, the TM, uh, TMJ complex. Uh, airway can be accomplished with with a much uh, smaller scan uh, in most most instances. Um, so hopefully that helps. But yeah, if we 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 only time we take that larger volume scan is when we have a patient who comes in and is having uh, TMD issues and we need to evaluate their their joint space by the way the cbct is fantastic and i didn't really talk about this too much um to be honest because i'm just getting into this a little bit myself but to, to, the cbct is very very helpful for evaluating the position of the condyle in the fossa 
and to, to give you just more information as far as what might be causing uh, any uh, TMD uh, issues that the patient might be having. So once again, it's just a, a nice tool to have in your toolbox to be able to help uh, come up with a diagnosis. All right. Uh, Ken also followed up on his question about the CT bite wing x-rays and asked, is there a reason why you don't take them in all patient CB bite wings? Yeah, I mean, I think once again, we're... Um, for, for me, I'm still a little bit in, in the adjustment phase of that. And, you know, change is, <laughs> change is hard, Ken. Change is, can be hard. And so, um, you know, we, we, we kind of mix up um, if a patient, for instance, gets bite wings every year, right? Once a year, we will generally alternate intraoral um, just simply because that is what I'm used to. And I haven't fully converted um, because change is hard, you know? I mean, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm you know, I'm all for um, you know, uh, making life easy, but at the same time, I want to make sure that I'm, that I'm seeing everything. And so I'm still a little bit in, in the transition phase because um, we've only had, we've only had these cone beams for, you know, maybe a year now. And so we, we slowly started in integrating the intraoral bite wings little by little, um, because you have to, you have to train your staff, right? You have to get everybody on board and then you have to figure out how you're going to bill them and, and, you know, whether insurance will, what, what they'll accept and what they'll pay for and things like that. So that once again, there is a little bit of a transition and for us in our office, and we've had some personnel turnover and things like that. You know, it's been a little bit of a slow transition, to be honest. But um, I think in those patients where you you almost are forced to do extra oral bite wings because they just can't tolerate intraoral, um, that that has really kind of allowed us to to speed up that transition a little bit and see what what is possible with that technology. Thank you so much for your insight, there, Dr. Manito. Um, I think that wraps up our Q and A session this evening. So Fantastic thank you work. again. Yeah. Thank you again for, for your time. Thanks everyone for coming out. And, and sorry, Corinne, I keep stepping on your toes here, but <laughs> I appreciate everyone. I know everyone was working today. And so I appreciate you all coming out and uh, listening to what I had to say. Awesome. No, thank you so much. We really appreciated your time and expertise this evening, Dr. Manito. Um, so thank you. And thank you to Plan Mecca for sponsoring this webinar, as well as for everyone who attended. Um, we would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks again. Hi, everyone.